Well, I think all of us can recall times in our lives when we have missed opportunities to speak up about the gospel. But the point really isn't to dwell upon the past. The point is to move forward. So in this video, we're going to talk about how the resurrection inspires us and the Holy Spirit empowers us to speak up for Jesus. So one of my favorite movies is Braveheart. You guys seen Braveheart? Okay, most of you seen Braveheart. On this side, this side has not. I was, this is the Braveheart side, the non-Braveheart side. That's interesting. So I've never seen such a dichotomous group. Anyway, so um, uh, I love the part, and it's, it's, it's a great movie about William Wallace, uh, a, a Scot who was trying to lead a revolution to throw off the oppressive uh, yoke of, of, of oppression, rather, of the English. And <clears throat> In leading the movement, he had to try to cobble together the different tribes and groups of people within the Scots in order to have a united movement to, to push back the, you know, really one of the most powerful armies in the world at that time. And one of his allies was Robert the Bruce. And one of the most poignant and surprising and, and disappointing events, and saddest, I should say, in the movie was when Robert the Bruce became a traitor and sided with the English against William Wallace. And in that, at the time that he did that was, in, according to the movie, the Battle of Falkirk where Wallace lost for the first time and eventually uh, he resigned and was captured by the English, tortured and killed. A couple years ago, or maybe, I guess it was last year, during the pandemic, when you're looking for a movie, you know, so you guys have probably been doing it, searching Netflix, what can we find? Oh, I saw a movie called The Outlaw King, and, and it caught my interest because it was about Robert the Bruce. And it showed the true story of Robert the Bruce, actually more accurate than Braveheart, by the way. I hate to break those, you know, the, the ambition, the, the, the ideas you had about Braveheart. A lot of it was true, a lot of it was not. But anyway, um, he actually did go back and forth between the Scots and the English and was kind of, I guess you could call him traitorous at that time. He was certainly indecisive, um, trying to pick the winner, you know, instead of picking a side and staying with it. But he chose at that point to be a courageous leader and to lead the Scots again. And this time they won. Um, and, it, and it shows that people who who make poor choices, who are disloyal, who are even cowardly, can be transformed into great leaders, who speak up, who lead out. And today we're going to look at a similar situation in the, Jesus, in the story of Jesus at Easter, in the gospel story. You know, Peter's denial of Jesus is well known. That's one of the, I'd hate for that to be one of the greatest things that's known about me, but it's certainly one of the, the things that's known most, uh, Peter's most known for is his denial of Jesus three times uh, but, uh, right after he was arrested. So we're going to look at that. We're going to see how, how, G, how Peter was disloyal at that point. But rather than focusing on his capitulation to fear and, and, and confusion, we're going to focus on his transformation to be a courageous leader. So let's take a look at the scriptures in Matthew 26, verses 30 to 35. Jesus predicted his, uh, this denial. This is not in your notes, so I'm going to just give you some background here. Jesus predicted Peter's denial right before it happened. <clears throat> verses uh, 30 to 35 in Matthew 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. So right after this happened... This was right after supper, right after the Last Supper. They'd had the first communion together, what we call communion. They called it <clears throat> Passover meal. But right after that, 
they left and went to Gethsemane, and we talked about that last week where Jesus prayed for hours. And the right after he finished his prayer, Judas Iscariot showed up with the soldiers from the, the high priest, and they arrested Jesus. And right after that, all the disciples fled, just as Jesus had said. Now, Peter tagged along in the distance, following Jesus and the group that arrested him. They took him to the high priest's house. He had a big outer court. And Peter's kind of tagging along behind a lot of other curiosity seekers. This is very early in the morning on Friday morning, the day that he was crucified. Verse 69 of Matthew 26. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was, was Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. What does the name Peter mean? Rock. How could this happen to the rock? Right? How could the rock wither in cowardice when, it, when he needed to stand behind Jesus and be loyal and defend him? How could that happen? Peter, Peter was the, 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 the leader of the twelve. He was the most outspoken one. He was the one that would speak up. He was the one when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, I know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You got it, Peter. You didn't figure that out. God revealed that to you. Flesh and blood didn't, didn't help you discern that. You got that from God the Father. How could he be the one that says, I, I, I don't even know Jesus. I swear I don't know him. And curse and say, I don't know him. Has there ever been a time when your courage melted in the face of fear, uncertainty, disappointment, failure? Has there ever been a time where maybe you promised to love for better or worse, and then when worse came along, you didn't love? You ever said, I'll never give up, I will never, 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 never give up, but you did. Have you ever said, I will never compromise my convictions. I will never do this. I will not do this. But you did. Have you ever failed to speak up about Jesus to a friend who didn't know him? Or a neighbor? Or a family member or work associate? I dare say every person in this room who calls himself a follower of Jesus has done that. I know I have. Have you ever caved to the pressure to keep quiet about your faith in the face of rejection or retaliation? Or because it's just not cool to do that where I go to school or where I work? You see, disappointment, difficulty, rejection, anxiety, failure, threats can take their toll on anyone. The good news is that Peter's story doesn't end here, does it? Even better news, neither does yours. Our story doesn't end with our compromise, with our giving up, with our capitulating to fear, with our giving in to peer pressure. That's not the end of our story. That's not the end of your story. The good news is that after the resurrection, something dramatically happened in Peter's life. He was a changed man. See, Jesus appeared after the resurrection to Peter and all the, 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 the rest of the 11. Judas Iscariot is gone now. 
He appeared to them, and he affirmed his love, and he affirmed his forgiveness for them. He even took Peter aside on one occasion, and three times he asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? You know everything. You know I love you. Almost as if to give Peter a chance to reaffirm and repent, repent, reaffirm his love and repent of his denial three times. He denied three times. He said, I love you, I love you, I love you three times. Jesus is that kind of God. He's a forgiving God. And he's a God that says, follow me. Keep your courage. Speak up. So after he forgave them and he affirmed his love to them and he showed himself alive to them, he commissioned them to be sent, as, as Justin just said. Even as, as the Father sent me, even so I'm sending you. And he commissioned them to go start the church and, and to reach the rest of the world. And then Jesus says, I'm out of here. And it was just them. After these resurrection appearances and that commission, Peter and the rest of the apostles were changed men. They founded the church. And today, roughly one out of every three people on this planet call themselves followers of Jesus because of the courage of the rock. It returned. And this time, it was not a failing courage. It was not a whimpering courage. It was a courage that stayed true. So rather than studying his capitulation, I want to study his transformation because I think that is something that we need to hear. Because all of us at some point, more than likely, have capitulated and given in to fear and not, and not held our courage and not spoken up for Jesus, those of us who are Christ followers. There's hope for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we study this story of the transformation of the Apostle Peter and the rest of the apostles, Lord, I see myself in Peter's denial. I remember the times when I didn't speak up for you as I should. And I'm certain that most of the people watching this today or sitting in this worship center could say, yes, that's, that's me too. But Lord, we are encouraged by the transformation that you made in Peter. And I pray, Lord, today that you would open our eyes to see how that can happen in each one of us. Give us courage, Lord. Give us the courage to live out our faith, to speak up about you, because it matters. We have friends and neighbors, work associates, family members who don't know you, Lord. And we want them to know you. Teach us, encourage us, strengthen us in your name. Amen. So, let's follow the, the history a little bit further. So Jesus appeared to the disciples and others for 40 days, and then 10 days later, the church was started. It happened on a Jewish feast called Pentecost, and it was at that time that the Holy Spirit came and manifested himself uh, in a special way, and from that point on, every person who becomes a follower of Jesus has the Holy Spirit living inside them. And when he filled the apostles and, and empowered them, amazing things happened. P Peter was inspired to preach a sermon. And it must have been before a big crowd because 3,000 people became Christ followers from that sermon. And all the other apostles were out there translating his speech, his talk into, into other languages so that multiple different groups of people who were Jews from other parts of the, of the world at that time Different, they spoke different languages. They all came to Christ, so it was a multi-ethnic thing. A short time later, we don't know if it's days or weeks. I suspect the shorter is more likely the case. Peter and John were on the way to the temple one day to pray, and they met a beggar, a lame beggar who was there. We talked about this a few weeks ago, and and they didn't give him what he thought they were going to give him. They thought they were going to toss some coins at him, but Peter says, oh, we, we don't have any silver, but what we have, we do give. Stand up and walk in the name of Jesus. So he healed him. And, and this guy that had been lame since birth is jumping up and down, and people had recognized him. They'd walked by him for, for years. So it creates a huge commotion. The people gather around, 
and Peter starts talking about the gospel again, and a massive number of people come to Christ, and the scripture says the number of disciples after that event, the number of disciples grew to 5,000. So in a few days or, or very few weeks, the church has gone from the apostles of Jesus and a few friends, about 120 at that time, to over 5,000. I mean, it's amazing. And who's the leader? The coward, the denier, the rock, who really is a rock now. So after this, this talk that led lots of other people to Christ following the, the healing of this beggar, the chief priest and the, uh, the, the Sanhedrin, the council of elders, the same ones who had crucified Jesus got upset about this. They thought they'd, they'd stomped out this Jesus movement when they killed the leader. And now here it is again, and there's 5,000 people who've come to Christ. And they're upset. So they arrest Peter and John, the same people that killed Jesus. They conducted a hearing. So let's pick it up here. Acts 4, verse 5. On the next day, the rulers and the elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, that's Peter and John, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? That is, heal this beggar. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. And there's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. How could this be the same guy that swore he didn't even know Jesus a few days earlier, just a few weeks earlier. How could it be the same guy who's standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the most powerful people in the Jewish community, the same people who had Jesus executed? How could this be the same guy? I mean, look at the courage. If you killed him, and God raised him from the dead, and that's why this guy's healed. We healed him in the name of Jesus. Well, Peter and John refused to stop talking about Jesus. The high priest got together and they said, what are we going to do? And they, they decided to threaten them and release them. And the first thing they did after they released them, Peter, first thing that Peter and John did after they were released, they went and held a prayer meeting with the rest of the followers, the, the leaders of the church. And here's an excerpt from their prayer. Read this with me, verse 27 of Acts 4. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Notice what they didn't pray that you and I might have prayed. They didn't pray, God, please drop balls of fire from heaven on these people and snuff them out so that we can do what you've called us to do. Or, God, please stop this persecution so that we can go about our business. They didn't do that. They didn't say, they didn't ask God to, to stop the persecution. They asked God to give them boldness to keep speaking. Now that's the rock. That's the rock that Jesus saw before he denied him. Now Jesus knew all that was going to happen. Just like he knew you and I would wither and not stand up for Jesus at times. But Jesus knows it inside of you. There's a rock. There's courage. What happened to Peter? How did this transformation happen? Two things. Two things. Number one, he witnessed personally the resurrected Christ in the flesh. There was no denying. He knew that this Jesus that was 
stone cold in the graveyard dead was now alive could eat fish could let them touch him he was not a ghost they were not hallucinating he was really in the flesh so they he witnessed the resurrected Christ he also received the Holy Spirit so here's our big idea this is the big idea that changed his life it's a big idea that can change us and cause us to speak up as well the resurrection inspires us and the Holy Spirit empowers us to speak up about Jesus the, resur- the resurrection inspires us and the Holy Spirit empowers us to speak up about Jesus and as God inspired and empowered Peter he wants to do the same thing for you and me and I'll tell you this is the key to fulfilling the 2021 challenge that Justin was just talking about what's that challenge that we would pray daily for lost people people who do not net yet know Jesus they would live sent weekly and would have gospel conversations a gospel conversation is a conversation about Jesus okay if you don't mention Jesus guess what it's not a gospel conversation it's not a church conversation it's a gospel conversation about Jesus what part of that challenge praying daily for lost people living sent weekly and having gospel conversation what part of that is most intimidating to you <laughs> having the gospel conversations so some of you may have said look pastor I think it's a good idea and all and I, I want some people to have gospel conversation but I'm just not gonna do that <laughs> I can't do that I, I'm, I'm not gonna do that I mean it's not allowed at my work you know I can't have a gospel conversation at work it's not allowed there they don't allow that at school it's not cool it's not school I, I'm on this team anybody you know if I if I have a gospel conversation it's not gonna be cool everybody else on there is not I work in this place and and uh, you know I just I can't have a I can't have a gospel conversation there I just can't inside of you there's a rock the Holy Spirit the same Holy Spirit that inspired Peter can give you courage to speak up you can have gospel conversations so what does Peter teach us about how to have gospel conversations I want to look at four things quickly what Peter teaches is about having gospel conversations let the resurrection inspire you and the Holy Spirit empower you to number one pray for gospel boldness to pray for gospel boldness what did Peter and John do as soon as they were released they went and had a prayer meeting they got together and prayed there's something we, we talked about this a couple weeks ago or actually last week about praying together something powerful about praying together right they prayed together encouraging each other and what they prayed for read it with me enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness pray for boldness if you're a little intimidated about having a gospel conversation pray for boldness we all need boldness look if Peter needed boldness we need boldness we all need boldness in fact the Apostle Paul said that he asked people to pray for him that he would would speak the word with with clarity speak the word boldly we all need boldness to speak up about Jesus in a culture that says that's not right you don't have the right to try to convince other people of your beliefs it's okay for you to believe that but you can't convince others about that that's just wrong now our culture will try to convince you about their beliefs <laughs> right but to speak about religious beliefs that's just not wrong folks our friends and our neighbors desperately need for us to speak up about Jesus the truth is we're God's plan there's no other plan to reach your neighbors to reach your lost family to reach your friends except you and me we are the plan there's no plan b this that's the that's plan a there's no plan b we need holy boldness to speak up about jesus to speak up about the gospel so let the this christmas season let the resurrection of jesus inspire you and let the holy spirit inside you empower you to pray for gospel boldness 
pray for boldness. Number two, let the resurrection of Jesus inspire you. And let the Holy Spirit empower you to put Christ first in your priorities. Put Christ first in your priorities. That's, that's one of those things that you expect to hear in church. I mean, you know, what, what's, the, what's the best answer for a question you're asked in small group or in church? Jesus, right? Okay. <laughs> right? So put Jesus first. Yeah, you know, I would never expected to come to church today and, and hear the pastor say, put Jesus first. You know, I never would have expected that. Yeah. What does it mean? What does it mean in, in the context of what we're talking about? What it means is that every time you meet someone, if Jesus is first in your priorities, every time you meet someone, you wonder if they know Jesus. And you're praying silently as you're having a conversation with them for an opportunity to find out if they do. Now, you may not have that conversation right then. It may be multiple conversations later, or it might be one right then. But if Christ is first, then getting to a gospel conversation is what you want to pray about and and what you want to have. You you, You want to find out if they have a relationship with Jesus. Years later, after the church started, Peter was one of many, like Paul and John and James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote letters to churches to encourage them. And he wrote a letter to encourage people who were being persecuted because of their faith. He knew a little bit about that. Eventually, he was crucified upside down, tradition has it. So he wrote to encourage them. And he actually put something in his first letter, 1 Peter, about how to have gospel conversations. It's 1 Peter 3.15. And he began this with this idea of putting Christ first in your priorities. Read this with me. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So this is about having gospel conversations, defending what you believe, you know, to others, communicating to others what you believe. And he began that Years ago, was saying pray for gospel boldness, but here in this letter, he's saying now you also need to pr- put God first, put Jesus first in your priorities. Honor Christ the Lord, honor Christ as Lord, as the one who is in charge and over everything in your life. Set him apart as holy, as special. So he is special, that is, he is in the first place in the slot of your priorities. He is the first priority. So the next step we should pray, we should take after we pray for gospel boldness and pray for our lost friends is, is put Christ first in our priorities so that we're thinking about that throughout the day. So give priority to Christ in your relationships. So we should let the, the resurrection inspire us and the Holy Spirit empower us to pray for gospel boldness, to put Christ first in our priorities. Number three, to prepare to have gospel conversations, to get ready, to be prepared to have gospel conversations. In other words, prepare to explain what you believe and why. He says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. That is, be prepared to have a gospel conversation about your hope, your gospel hope. Preparation gives confidence, right? I mean, have you ever gone into a meeting or gone into a a class to take a test or to get ready for a game and you realize you're just not prepared? How does that feel? Really uncomfortable, right? You're not prepared and you don't feel like you're at your best and you're a little embarrassed about what's going to happen. If we're prepared, we'll have more confidence. So it's directly tied, preparation is directly tied into boldness. Like, if if you've worked hard and you've studied hard, then bring the test on, man. You know, I want a bat. You know, we're down two runs and there's two runners on. I want a bat. 
because I'm prepared. I spent a lot of time in a batting cage. I prepared. I've studied the, this pitcher. I know what he's going to pitch. I've watched him work through the batters. I know what he pitched me the last two times. Get me. I want to get in there. Confidence because you're prepared. When you're ready to make a sales pitch and you're prepared, you want to you do it. You may, there may be a little fear, trepidation, but you're confident because you're prepared. So we need to prepare. What, what does that mean? A couple things. A couple things just to, we, we can talk a lot about this, but a couple things. Number one, prepare to share your salvation story. Prepare to share your salvation story. And, and a great way to look at that is the way the Apostle Paul shared his salvation story twice in Acts. There was basically four outline points that he covered. Number one, my life before Christ. What my life was like before Christ. Number two, how I discovered I needed Christ. What was it that opened my eyes to the fact that, you know, I'm a sinner, I need Christ? Number three, how I became a Christ follower. And then finally, number four, my life since I became a Christ follower. So that's basically what you need to, in order to share your story. It'll be different if you became a Christ follower at eight or nine years old versus 25 or 45. It'll be different, but that's, that's fine. Everybody needs different stories. And the thing about telling your story is, it's your story. I mean, no one can ob object to your experience. They can't deny what you experience. They can, they can object to the gospel, but it's your story. <laughs> and no one knows your story better than you, right? So no one can be more confident in telling your story than you. So prepare. It helps to be prepared. I found that it's helpful to write that out. Not memorize it, but just so that you get it in your mind, so that you can share it. It shouldn't take you 10 minutes to share your story. You can share your story in two or three minutes. You should be able to do that. I mean, you could expand on it more, but be able to share it quickly. And I would say prepare to share his salvation story. That is, be able to, to, to walk your way through how a person becomes a follower of Jesus. And there are a lot of ways to do that, and, and you can study. If you, if, I encourage you to look up plan of salvation and, and on the internet or in, in books and find a way to do that and, and, and find a way that fits with you. Uh, something I'm starting to use now more often than, than, than not is the, gospel in four, the, the Bible in four words. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. You can explain the whole Bible in four words. We, we did a series on that a few years ago, and you could really talk about creation and then fall, Adam and Eve's fall. Uh, and we've been living in the fallen world, broken world ever since then, right? Um, and then redemption is God's plan uh, to, to bring us back to him and to forgive our sins. And we all need our brokenness healed and put back together. But we do that through, through Jesus. That's what Jesus is all about. And restoration is what he wants to do in us, to restore that brokenness and give us a life forever in heaven. So, I mean, you can explain the Bible in four words and, and tell the gospel story uh, that way. So, but there are many ways to do that. So there's not one right way. And th the idea is to have a conversation in this. It's not to, to just do just a presentation, but have a conversation as you're going through this. Does that make sense to you? Or anything like that ever happened to you? So just kind of talking about that. Number four, let the resurrection inspire you and the Holy Spirit empower you to participate in gospel conversations gently and respectfully. Gently and respectfully. Honestly, that should give you a, a, a holy sigh of relief. Whew. Okay, he's not asking me to preach. Okay, he's not asking me to give a lecture. He's asking me to be real, to be gentle, not obnoxious, <laughs> okay? I've seen those people who are obnoxious. I've heard them talk about the gospel in an obnoxious way. I don't want to do that. The Bible says don't do that. That's what Peter says, don't do that. Be gentle and respectful. Talk less and listen more. Be curious about the person you're talking to. Ask questions about their life about their family, about their interest, about their job, about their beliefs. 
And then if God gives you an opportunity, tell your story and tell his story. It's not complicated, but it does take some boldness. So, this Easter, let the resurrection inspire you. And the Holy Spirit empower you to pray for gospel boldness. To put Christ first in your priorities. To prepare to have gospel conversations. And then to participate in those gospel conversations by being yourself. Be gentle. Don't be obnoxious. Be bold, but not obnoxious. Be respectful. Now, if you're watching this today, or if you're in here in, in live, and you're not a follower of Jesus, you may be feeling a little uncomfortable and feeling like, everybody's looking at me, and there's a target on my back. Okay, I could understand how you would feel that way. I'd probably feel that way as well. Let me share this with you. There was a time when every person who now calls themselves a follower of Jesus was not a follower. You're not born a follower. There's no such thing as someone who's born a follower. We have to choose to follow Jesus. And I can tell you from my perspective, and I believe everyone else who is watching this message or, or, or listening to it in, in person would say, I'm glad that people had gospel conversations with me because eventually it clicked. And I realized I wanted to know Jesus and I wanted to trust him. And I'm eternally grateful for those people who had the courage to speak up, maybe when I didn't even want to listen, but they loved me enough and they loved Jesus enough to speak up. <laughs> and now I'm a follower of Jesus. And, and it is the main thing in my life. It has transformed my life, all of my relationships, how I approach life. So if you're not a follower of Jesus, I hope you don't feel threatened because that's the last thing we want you to feel. We want you to feel that we love you. We care about you. And we just hope that you see in Jesus what we see in Jesus and what the Bible says is in Jesus is someone who can transform your life, forgive you for your sins, heal your brokenness, and give you eternal life. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you're just hoping that someone would have a gospel conversation with you. Well, that's it. That Jesus loves you enough that he stepped out of heaven into a human body, lived in our messed up world. Brokenness is not new. <laughs> There's plenty of brokenness in Jesus' day. And he was killed by that, actually. But he died willingly. He was God in the flesh. He didn't have to die. He chose to die as a sacrifice for our sins because the penalty for sin is death. Separation from God eternally, that kind of death. And Jesus paid that penalty for us so that we can be forgiven through the life in the blood of Jesus. He offers you forgiveness. And today you can be forgiven and he can begin to heal the brokenness in your life. And today, if you trust Christ, you will have a ticket that's punched already for eternal life. If that's what you'd like to have, you can trust Christ today and ask him to forgive you for your sins and commit to be one of his followers. Let's pray. If that's you, if you would like to become a follower of Jesus today, would you just tell Jesus that? That's your decision. No one can decide for you. You have to choose Jesus. But if that's what you want, if you want to be forgiven, if you want to leave regrets behind and get rid of guilt and truly be forgiven and to be restored to God and to have brokenness healed and receive eternal life, just trust Christ today. Would you tell him that? Jesus, I trust you. Forgive me for my sins. You know there are many. Heal my brokenness. Help me put that behind me, Lord. Give me a new life in you. I want to be one of your followers. Show me what to do next. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. 
all those times I pushed you away. Thank you for keeping it up, Lord. I trust you. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, I hope you found this video valuable. If you did, be sure to give us a like. And uh, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and subscribe to our channel. That way you don't miss any of this great content that we put out on a weekly basis. You know, we have a mission here at Canopy Roads Baptist Church, and that is to develop fully devoted followers of Christ. If you would like to partner with us in that mission, I want to give you two quick ways that you can do that. Number one, you can go directly to our website at canopyroads.org forward slash giving, or you can scroll down in the description and click on the link that's there. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you back here next week.